to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo, listen up, listen up, yeah. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. The wireless woman. You in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. All right. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, the original wireless woman, welcoming you back to our spot, room 303. If you are new, welcome to my crew, but my returnees, my returnees, you know what we do. If you like this video, well then, like this video video let the comments reveal how you really feel and if you're feeling a vibe we'll go ahead on and subscribe but before you blink share this link welcome back wi-fi's to not quite the season ender of season two wireless or not nah, season of the wireless woman but close okay close this is actually the last time you are going to hear that intro you know how I love to keep things different. <laughs> you know how I love change. Um, I actually don't love change. My anxiety won't let me embrace change all the time. But I do like to be an unpredictable person, though. That's the cancer in me. But so many things are going to be changing for season three. And losing that intro is one of them. So, you know, for my returnees. Ah, this is going to be the last time that you see me doing what we do. But I do have some exciting changes coming for the upcoming season. But today's transmission, we will be talking all about the generation of wealth. We talk about generational wealth transfers. But baby, you got to have a generation of wealth to be able to transfer anything. And the fortunate, unfortunate part about being black right now is the fact that we are the generation of wealth. We are the dream of our ancestors. But what are we doing with that wealth? Before I go on my tirade, before I go full rent, you already know what time it is. What are we gonna do tomorrow night? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. It is time to have all of my beautiful black brothers and sisters to the front of the class. It is time for our next transmission. All right. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. Wi-Fi's welcome back to yet another transmission of the wireless woman. Go ahead and do me a favor on your way in and like this video. Why? Well, when you like it, I love it. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. And make sure you click the notification bell for notifications of when I upload new content and when I go live so that you can get all of the news that you can actually use. So today I'm going to get to the point of why I was here in the first place and talk about the generation of wealth. <laughs> as young black Americans, particularly millennials. I feel like millennials have been the big ball droppers, but we have had more wealth than black people have ever seen. And we are still having conversations about how do we pass on generational wealth? Because I mean, we are the first generation that really has been in thrive energy you know, all the way up until our parents, black people were still pretty much in survival mode. You know, our parents were the first to go to college, first to own a home, first, you know, for many of us, and some of us didn't necessarily come out of having educated two-parent homes with homeowner homes, but our parents did well enough to put us in those positions, you know. Um, teenage pregnancy is down 
a whole lot in the black community. And we have actually made some really great strides that if we weren't so busy fighting and arguing and disrespecting each other and telling each other how much our accomplishments don't matter at all, we could actually applaud each other and appreciate each individual accomplishment that has helped to lead us to this place of even having the ability to choose. And the fact that we have so much privilege is the reason why we're starting to see um, just capitalistic, supremacist, colonist views coming into our culture and our society. It really shows us what all of the marching and protesting and boycotting was for. It was so that we could be equal with white people, and now we are. And now we have all their problems. But if you follow me on TikTok, and you should, but if you don't, <laughs> a lot of things that happen in my personal life, I will either put in Instagram <laughs> or on TikTok. You can see my kids and my family and things like that. Uh, YouTube really isn't the place for that. I see a lot of YouTubers doing like family content. And I think it's beautiful if you can get over here and pull it off. But to me, I think YouTube is too personal of a platform that you really reveal too much of your personal life because it's a long, it's a long podcast platform that you can really, I think, exploit your, your personal life and family over here. I've seen a lot of couples that got married and did really great content over here that people enjoyed and followed and they brought their kids into it and then they got a divorce <laughs> because behind all the things that we couldn't see was real life and real family and when you put more than about three minutes of your <laughs> family life up for other people to see and judge I think I think it's my personal opinion it puts too much pressure on relationships so TikTok is the place to go <laughs> if you want to see a little bit more candid version of me. I know everybody comes over here and watches my long form podcast and thinks that's who I am, but it's not. It's my platform. It's what I'm about, not necessarily who I am deep inside. <laughs> and um, so over there, you can see a lot more facets or different facets of my personality, which help give you a more complete picture. Still not the complete picture over there either, but, you know, like you to go over to TikTok and follow me because when I was over on TikTok, I posted a video talking about buying my house. Those of you who have been over here on YouTube with me know that I'm in a home buying process. Oh God. They about to wear me out, okay? Um, it's been years in the making for me to stand in this moment. And when I went to my holiday party with my family, my aunt pulled me to the side and she said, hey, I know you're buying a house. I want to help you out. I know you're going to need, you know, help. And she said, I want to give you your inheritance now. I want to give you part of your inheritance now to help out. And I thought it was a beautiful thing for a woman to be extending the hand of inheritance to another woman. You know, inheritance has always been something that has passed along patriarchal lines. I mean, there's some matrilineal societies where women have been able to hold on to property and pass it to children, but it's very rare. It's the reason why children are given their father's name, le legitimate children anyway, because it's supposed to give those children a legitimate claim to his inheritance. When my aunt bought her home, she was a single woman. And let me give a little bit of a caveat here because my aunt didn't marry until she was about 55 years old. Um, so she never had any children because baby, if my aunt had had children like I did, <laughs> probably wouldn't have been no inheritance, uh, especially not for children that weren't her children. But, you know, we have been grafted in, grafted into the vine. Um, 
due to the fact that she didn't have children, um, didn't have someone to leave things on to. I'm listening to, you know, a lot of black men be super, uber, mega proud of not having children. And I'm not saying they should or shouldn't be. I don't know their situation. But what I do know is that when you work hard in your life to accomplish things, part of the thoughts that you have is who will these things go to after me? Or there should be. For people who own assets and not just liabilities, they have to think about these things. I work in the finance industry and people come in all the time and they're like, hey, I need to put this person's name on this account. Hey, I want to get these things set up so that this person won't have to jump through hoops and, you know, things won't go to an estate when I'm going. I want to make sure they can pass directly from me to this person, something they call pass through accounts or payment on death accounts, you know, and they start setting these things up in life because they know, hey, I'm not going to spend all of this money. I can't take these things with me where I'm going. So who can benefit from my life? in that way. So I came on this podcast to really begin to challenge us as Black people to have these thoughts, that as we're moving into these deeper levels of financial success, that we not try to consume everything we work for in our lifetimes, in our lifetimes. You know, when my father passed, he left me and my children nothing. This is my father's sister who's letting me know in her lifetime that not only does she have something for me in her death, she has something for me in her life. That's a beautiful thing to be able to live that way, but it also takes a heart for the people that have been around you doing life with you to even make sure those people are set up. And I got to be honest, it's a thing, I said it on my TikTok, of biblical proportions to be able to give your children their inheritance in your lifetime to see who they are as people and what they will do with the work of your life. That's what the prodigal son's father got to see. <laughs> he got to see what the son he raised was made of, both of them, by giving them their inheritance while he was still alive to see it. And one thing that's great is that I know my aunt knows me, you know, her being willing to step out and help me is a product of the woman she's seen me be. Because baby, I don't think I'd be getting no inheritance right now if it hadn't been for how hard I've worked in my own life for her to say, let me come alongside you. And we as women always expect that to only be men. Because I did not want to buy another house as an unmarried woman. I just didn't. I've owned a home before. And when I went through my divorce, it became very difficult to do what being a homeowner required financially, <laughs> physically, spiritually. And so these years between my first home that I owned and the second home that I'm buying have been about being a woman that was ready in many different ways to be a homeowner again. And knowing from firsthand experience what that takes, what that entails. And I saw that same maturity and that same growth in me from my first marriage to my second marriage. You have to be intentional about where you're going and understand what it will require of you. There are so many people out here who say they want to get married. I had to speak specifically to men about this because y'all are the ones who are the gatekeepers of marriage. Yes, 70% of divorces are filed by women. This is very true. <laughs> you could call women the gatekeepers of divorce if you'd like, if that makes you feel better about it. And no, no man or woman is going into a marriage, hopefully, thinking to themselves, you know, I'm going to capitalize off this relationship and then leave. For the people who have worked on themselves as people to present themselves as suitable partners, lifelong partners for another person, which part of that work can only be done from inside the marriage. It just, it just is what it is.
I don't see how you can hate from outside of the club. You can't even get in. You can't prepare fully for parenthood. You get a baby and you do a great job as a baby parent. <laughs> do a horrible job as a teenage parent. You know, when my teenagers got older, it became so much harder to be emotionally vulnerable with them than when they were little kids. You know, there are stakes in the relationship as they get older and they become adults and trying to get them to adjust from one area of development to the next can create challenges in the relationship that you have to have life skills to be able to navigate. A lot of people want to stay their kids' friends when they get older, and then they raise narcissists. So you have to have new skills to deal with new challenges. But I want to say that I think it's been great to see women with wealth and to see women being the ones disseminating the value systems in the culture because we have an opportunity with our education, with our wealth, with our upward mobility, with our access to resources now to show not just our men, but the world what that was supposed to have looked like. What those of us who had the ingenuity to build wealth, it was supposed to be so that we could share it. Wealth, technology, knowledge, industry with the world. Technology was supposed to make the world a better place to live in. It wasn't supposed to create classes and castes of people. It wasn't supposed to give certain people an unfair advantage to be able to subjugate and capitalize off of other people. The unfortunate part, though, is that I'm seeing a lot of male-identified women who are passing on, and it's crazy because we do it in two ways, who are passing on the core value system of the dominant culture of the patriarchy. We do it in two ways. One by, you know, <laughs> anything you can do, I can do better by trying to out men men. Um, they call that being masculine, but that's actually not it. That's what the female counterpart is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring balance to what men do. So when they take it there, when they go high, maybe we go higher because that's what a woman is. She's a multiplier. So it's actually the most feminine thing a woman can do, not to necessarily compete with men because they think that stuff is a competition when we know it ain't no competition there. It really isn't. A woman can do anything a man can do better usually that's why she's the administrator of his home because whatever his vision is she can actually bring it to life she's the multiplier if he see a child she can give him a child if he buy a house she can give him a home so it's never been a competition we're supposed to one up whatever they do but in one up in this trash garbage ridiculousness that they own right now we're creating a world we don't want to live in and then two, the second way we uphold patriarchy is by condescending to it. There's a lot of women who are male identified, very masculine in their thinking. They are male apologists. They will say things like, well, a man going to be a man. You can't expect for a man to, and a man, he need to come home to a woman. That, and their whole thought process for how they live their lives is formed about is formed around what men want, what men like, what pleases a man, what make a man feel like a man, how to make a man be a man. And it's a very masculine energy to be in. <laughs> trying to guess everything, trying to know everything that a man wants, that is the masculine energy. Be who you are, have some standards about yourself, have some goals and visions of your own, and then find people men and women and children that see your vision, build a team wherein the skills and the traits that you bring to the team add value. I'm a truth teller child, okay? Um, since I was a scapegoat in my family dynamics, I hold very tightly to reality and to truth. 
I was groomed in a household with narcissistic parents who consistently scrambled my reality. They consistently gaslit me into believing that what was real was not real and what was fake was real. That's what everyone needs to know about us. You don't tell people what's going on in this household. You tell people this instead. So being a truth teller child put me in a situation of being a black sheep amongst my own family. I've never had the type of protection and provision in my family that my sister had or that other family members had because they were willing to play the game. So in order for me to be a part of anyone's team, they got to want to have a truth teller on their team. People who don't value reality and the truth, people who value people who see things the way they want them to be seen will not find value in having a person like me on their team. You have to know that about yourself. Now, I could sit around with... And and I won't even say that, you know, people who are not the truth teller are bad people. They see things the way they should be. They see the rose colored, you know, they they wear the rose colored glasses. They're agreeable. They're easier to get along with. A strong team has diversity on it. A strong team has diversity in it. So I do not reject people who see things differently from me. My job is to see in part and prophesy in part. I give perspective, not that my perspective is the entirety of consciousness because it isn't. There are other people who see the bright side of things. They see the bright side. And they show it to me because I didn't see it, baby. I wasn't, (laughs) that didn't cross my mind. I didn't even consider that. I didn't put that in my equation of how this was probably going to work out. So I don't fault other people for being those people for being more agreeable. It depends on what the goal of the team is, what type of team members you need. So I could sit around with the yay sayers and learn to be like them. But if the whole body was an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body was an ear, where would the vision, where would the sight be? So I feel confident in who I am and what I bring to a team that values my contribution. Women go where you're appreciated, (laughs) go where you're celebrated. You know, to me, that's being in your feminine energy. It's figuring out how far you can take that, how successful you can be. And as long as you are a shadow, a mirror, trying to outdo what someone else is doing, you can't really fully be in your creative chaos energy. Go to the place where people have room for you to become your highest form because you're always going to take what a man gives you and multiply it. You're always going to be greater than him. You have a calling. You're a hero, Hancock. You're going to be miserable the rest of your life until you accept that. I'm sorry. I know men hate to hear me say that. But it's the truth. That's what you were created to be. Because if he could have done it without you, God wouldn't have created the woman. The woman was created to bring help. It said it was not good for a man to be alone and that God would create a helper that's suitable for him. So man's helper is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has access to things that even God can't do for you in this realm. The Holy Spirit comes to help the work that Jesus already finished. (laughs) If it was done, what you need the Holy Spirit for? He's also an helper. And that is what women have to understand about who they are and what their role is. You came in, you were brought to life for the purpose of being a helper. So think of what I'm saying. When you help, when you call for help, if I'm in a house, someone's breaking in my house and I call for help, I call for someone who can do more than what I can do. 
if the police were to show up without guns, <laughs> without numbers, without force, I wouldn't call them when I need help. When I call social services for help, I'm hoping they got access to resources that I don't because <laughs> otherwise they can't help. And sometimes they will tell you, I can't help. If that person can't do more than what you could do, they are not your help. I'm grateful to have lived in a family of women that have taught me what womanhood is. We place so much emphasis on manhood and we expect men to be our help. When that is not even how it was designed, women, you are powerful beyond measure. You know, I pray so much blessing on my aunt, on the women in my family, um, for her even reaching back and saying, hey, I see where you are and I want to help. But the crazy part about it is she is blessed. She was blessed to be a blessing. This is her acting out of the overflow of the blessing that she's lived in. And like I said, my aunt spent the majority of her life as a single woman because she wanted to be married, to have children. She waited so late, um, which I can't say she waited so late because like I said, men are the guardians of marriage. But due to what we know as women can be poor choices sometimes, she had to wait on a partnership, on a mate that could meet her where she was and where she was going. And so she ended up not being able to have children. But even in the Bible, it talked about a certain patriarch who wanted his daughters to have an inheritance with the sons. And I just came on this podcast after many minutes to say <laughs> that women, it's your time now to have an inheritance in this patriarch patriarchal system. So in the Bible, in biblical times, women had to either marry or have a son in order to have part of the inheritance because it was patrilineal. You know, it, it passed along the father's line. And we see that notion having to change in Joshua when it comes to the daughters of Zelophehad. I don't know how you say that name. But if these biblical men could change, could change their mind about the value of a woman and protecting women and providing for them, leaving provision for women who, for whatever reason, have not been connected to men. We as women also have to change our minds about what we feel the patriarchy provides to us and at what cost to our personhood forget womanhood personhood we need to be looking at the way we're being treated the way we're being regarded in this current system and think of how that applies to a to the entirety of said system if our men had their way would they create a society that was liberated? Would they create a society that favored equality for all? See, that's liberation and baby, I want it. Or would they continue the patriarchy, even though patriarchy has failed? Patriarchy has failed to even secure for them what they want. It has failed to provide for them submissive, kind, compassionate wives. We're under a patriarchal system. That's where your gender war is taking place. So I say that to say, whether it be patriarchy or matriarchy, is there a more perfect union? Maybe we got to get the archy out. And Kiana Diallo said on his show that anarchy is the best system of black love where nobody rules anybody everyone participates of their own volition to the extent that it benefits each person men benefit from having women and wives their lives are longer and more fulfilling women benefit from having husbands and men, they have protection and 
in in the places where men are doing what they're supposed to do, they have provision. It's supposed to give you something to multiply because two times zero, baby, is still zero. But I'd rather be two than be multiplied times zero and be zero with a zero. And I think a lot of other women are starting to wake up and choose themselves for that very reason. You're a multiplier. Even if I give you one, you can only be multiplied to what you came into the situation with. One times three is still just three. Men got to give you at least two. At least that. In order for you to help. Okay, your 50, his 50, that's not you helping him, all right? We've got to be with men who are willing to give 100% because if they were already willing to give 100% and only have to give 70 or 60, now you've helped. But if they were only willing to give 50, they're not going to see your 50 as help because, heck, that was, that's, that's what I do. But if they're doing 100% and you can come in and bring 60%, bring 50%, bring 30%, bring 40% because he understands your part and your role. Like what I was saying about my son, <laughs> because he understands your part and your role because he's had to do it. He's going to have so much more respect for your contribution. So listen, all these people that are trying to sell you on the patriarchy, y'all can go ahead and clock out for me. Okay. Go ahead, because we're done with a system that has proven to fail the people that need it the most. If you see what I see, if you feel as I feel, you picking up what I'm putting down. But if you see what I see, if you feel as I feel, and if you would seek as I seek. <laughs> Go ahead and drop that fire headphones emoji in the comments. I look forward to engaging with you there. Until the next time. Y'all are dismissed. You already know what to do. Go ahead and clock out for me. Section leaders, what is our concept? One band, one sound. One band, one sound.